welcome to Rockstock Channel. It is April 13th, and we are very privileged here to have Neil Froneman, the CEO of Sabanya Stillwater, who has made two meaningful investments in lithium, um, also in nickel, uh, an established PGM player with assets in, in Africa and, and the United States, uh, but also a long history in gold and uranium. It's not every day we have someone uh, with so much experience in, and success in creating shareholder value as you, Neil. So we're going to go into your strategy in battery materials in particular. Having uh, 37 years of uh, exposure to the mining industry, I've got lots of scars on my back, but I must tell you that uh, every thrash has, uh, has been a learning experience and uh, I really do enjoy our industry, um, and uh, at the moment we we're riding a high. But uh, just a little bit more on my background: I came through the ranks. I'm very I'm very proud of the fact that uh, I worked as an engineer on the mines. I worked on the face. Um, I have something as simple as a blasting ticket. Um, I don't profess to be an expert in mining, but I certainly I certainly know the mining business and the business of of mining well and um, i spent most of my life in in gold uh, platinum a little bit in coal in uranium as you referred to um, but but predominantly in hard rock mining um, I've, I've built companies um, listed on the, on the tsx the asx the jsc and the new york stock exchange and and all of them have been uh, uh, good experiences but more recently uh, in 2013, I put up my hand and volunteered um, to, to take on the role at Sabanya uh, Gold, as it was known at the time. We, in fact, gave it the name. And that was uh, based on the fact that we, we were looking at trying to buy Driefontein from Goldfields. In fact, it was a wonderful platform. Take on some really high-quality assets, turn them around, which is what we did as a team. We started off at a one-and-a-half million ounce uh, South African a gold producer. We positioned the company as an industry leading dividend payer. We had good uh, rock breaking skills and the PGM industry in our view was uh, in, in a position where it needed to be consolidated. We also did our research on supply and demand and, um, and we realized supply was, was pretty much constrained, not easy to bring on uh, significant amounts of supply and and the industry had been undercapitalized since 2008 um, but demand looked good in the not too distant future we recognized uh, palladium was going to be the standout so we we started implementing our strategy of turning sabanya gold into a precious metals company by entering the pgm uh, commodity market and um, we made a number of acquisitions very targeted acquisition in the US uh, being the stored operations, which are, are really the biggest primary producer of palladium in the world. Uh, second only to Norilsk Nickel, which produces palladium as a byproduct. And, and that kept coupled with our first exposure uh, to the circular economy um, really set us apart. So uh, up until 2000 uh, 18, 19, we established ourselves as a leading PGM company. We number one in platinum, number two in palladium, number one in rhodium, number one in iridium, and number one in ruthenium. That was a, a really exciting journey, and um, and it's turned out really well. It it, uh, it turned out that it was a low in the uh, PGM commodity cycles, and um, we created a uh, very significant value for our shareholders, which is our primary job. Um, uh, we also at that time realized doing the research on um, the, the long-term drivers for um, PGMs uh, from a demand perspective, uh, it was interesting to note that um, uh, battery electric vehicles were going to make significant inroads into the global carpool. And um, I want to right up front say we are much co more conservative on our view regarding these penetration rates than most, but nevertheless, significant enough uh, for us to see a, a value proposition. And then we, we started our due diligence 
uh, into the battery metals market in 2019 by acquiring SFA Oxford, who are well known in the PGM space, but uh, had done a lot of work for um, many of the OEMs on the electric powertrain. Mm -hmm. And over a two year period, which actually was disrupted uh, by COVID, and we can talk about that, but uh, we developed our uh, views on, on which were the, the most appropriate battery metals. And then in 2021, we made our, our first acquisitions of, uh, of battery metal um, uh, assets being um, Kellerbe in Finland, uh, the Rye Light Ridge project in Nevada. We bought a nickel refinery in France. Um, we uh, entered into an acquisition with Apian uh, on um, copper and nickel assets in, in Brazil, but we later terminated that. We so. continue to evaluate uh, opportunities to enter the, the battery metal space. When you now put uh, together um, PGMs, which are cons considered green and will ultimately underpin the, the hydrogen economy, um, got good fundamentals. When you couple that with battery metals, um, which are clearly green, you, you, you start seeing a portfolio of green energy metals and um, unique. There's no one that has a combination of PGMs and, and battery metals. When you couple that with uranium, which at long last is really being seen as a green metal, um, and you couple that with um, our entries into the circular economy through um, PGM recycling, of which we're the biggest uh, in North America, and you couple that with our significant entries into tailings retreatment, you have a, a unique portfolio um, from a mining company perspective uh, of greenness. So we, we class leading in, in terms of um, reducing our carbon footprint, producing metals that are going to reverse uh, climate change. And of course, underpinning that is gold. Gold is, uh, is an insurance policy when uh, we are entering a phase now, which I believe is going to see perhaps a, a global economic recession, gold will play its role. Important natural hedge against um, metals that uh, are exposed to the, the economic prosperousness of the rest of the world. So that's the story behind Sabanya Stillwater. Like what, what is the impact of COVID on the EV metals thematic? Now, Russia sanctions, you know, on commodity markets in particular, palladium, nickel, uranium. And COVID-19 is a good example of a gray elephant that was known and, and yet um, was ignored. And of course, we all suffered the repercussions of that pandemic. And, and of course, we're now facing another pandemic, which is uh, Russia invading the Ukraine. That, that's, a, that's a pandemic in its own right. But... The, the gray elephants um, are um, pandemics. And, and of course, like COVID-19, we, we expect probably another two or three um, uh, virus type pandemics uh, this decade. Um, and, and part of our repositioning or strategic repositioning is ensuring that we, we build pandemic resilient ecosystems, which is why we, we uh, first of all, target North America and Europe. Um, one of the other gray elephants, uh, and you're seeing it play out now at a rapid rate, is the polarization of the world. And um, you've seen the East and the West uh, really divided around Russia, and it's got big impacts on supply chains, commodity prices, and, and so on. The uh, gray elephant of climate change, the gray elephant of aging, the fourth and fifth industrial revolution, you need to be more focused on people than on industrialization. That so all of these gray elephants probably affect poor people the most. And you, you, you have to be very cognizant of a lot of angry people due to pandemics, due to global warming, due to polarization, due to the big squeeze. And, um, and we are all, all seeing that, you know, from an inflationary point of view and so on. We could just talk about um, the, EC, the ESG considerations. Do you think that's an important factor, or do you think you, you know you've got to get the job done? Maybe those will will adjust slightly. There's a huge amount of uh, ESG um, 
pressures being put uh, on investors and and of course that flows through to us and i think quite rightly so look our primary job is to create value for our shareholders and we are we are very disciplined in doing that and in fact if we don't do that there is there is nothing else to contribute from an esg perspective i believe mining is good where you can put together a combination of metals and um, exposure to uh, let's call it uh, the circular economy, uh, which is, is, is not far from our core business of mining, such as tailings retreatment and, and using our, our processing facilities uh, to recycle. You, you have a, an incredible combination of, of um, metals with wonderful properties, both in battery metals and in um, let's call it uh, cleaning the air in internal combustion engines. Neil, can you just give us some sort of color on, on your logic and, and drivers for your investments so far in, in Caliber and, and INEA? What is it uh, that sort of you know, attracted you to those? We have chosen two ecosystems that we want to be part of. That is North America and Europe. And not only as a contract miner supplying metals, we learned very quickly through PGMs, when you have um, skin in the game slightly further downstream, doesn't mean you, you're going to produce batteries, but where you're working with the OEMs, you can create much better uh, integrated and much more sustainable business models, uh, which is why we take small stakes in, in, um, in, in battery uh, um, production, so gigafactories. Um, so, so from a strategic level, Europe and North America, and then you start looking at um, um, what are your primary uh, metals. So PGMs, let's park them because we're talking uh, battery metals now. Um, now, our view is that lithium and nickel, doesn't matter what region of the world you're looking at, are going to, to be the primary metals. Manganese, cobalt um, are probably going to be thrifted out. We have been very focused on what we have a high degree of confidence in, that's lithium and, and nickel. And then, then of course, um, it is difficult to find um, opportunities, entry opportunities. Um, Caliber was a great one. One of the other very important things we look at is the is the carbon footprint of these operations and there's no point in positioning yourself as a as a green metals company and then having coal assets the same thing with uh, lithium and nickel if you're going to um in my mind be part of uh, nickel out of indonesia you 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 eventually gonna um, find it very difficult to sell that nickel and certainly i don't think you're going to be commercial um, so Caliber was a, a brilliant opportunity in a great mining jurisdiction in Finland. Uh, very, um, very beneficial um, environmental uh, and, and low carbon footprint. Um, the the Ioneer uh, opportunity at, at Rye Light Ridge was also identified as, as a great commercial opportunity with the carbonic acid as a, as a byproduct would put us in the in the lower quartile, but um, um, being uh, um, also in a good mining jurisdiction, being Nevada, but also being close to the market, both both Caliber and um, and the Rye Light Ridge uh, project are close to the market, which means the 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 additional carbon footprint um, through transport and all these other things is going to be very beneficial, and there will be uh, commercial benefits. Uh, for, for being some of the greenest lithium in the world. Um, and, and just to, to say it's not a, it's not a perception or, or an impression, we actually do receive a premium uh, for our platinum out of still water because it's considered the greenest platinum in the world. That is, that is going to happen fast. Uh, metals are going to be tracked not only from a provenance point of view, but also their, their carbon footprint because, uh, you know, you, you can't build um, um, green vehicles in, in Europe using 
uh, metals or materials that um, detract from what, what you're trying to achieve. So these things are all going to be tagged and you will get a benefit uh, of, of, let's say, higher ESG um, credentials for your products. So that, that's really what, what drove us into those areas. Now, clearly Europe and North America probably will, will never be self-sufficient until there's significant recycling. Um, um, but other, other jurisdictions such as the, um, the APN assets in Brazil were of interest to us, also had good um, environmental uh, uh, footprints. And um, in fact, some of those metals are already coming uh, through our nickel refinery in France. Um, um, but unfortunately, there was a material adverse uh, uh, effect there with a the geotechnical event, and we had to uh, step away from that uh, transaction. But Rodney, that's how we, we thought about it. Now, you, you, you probably would want some tangible, um, let's call it investment criteria. Um, our board will not approve anything unless it's value accretive on a cash flow per share basis. Of course, you can also bullshit yourself and, and use a lot of debt and make it cash flow per share enhancing. We're not, uh, we're not, um, we're not uh, bullshitting ourselves. Uh, we do look at IRRs. Um, IRRs have to be well in excess of 15%. Um, we do look at uh, you know, a reasonable return um, you know, we want to see a return on, on, on our investment within uh, two to three, maybe four years. Um, and um, and those, those are all considerations that come into the mix. But our strategy derives, drives the targeted area, drives uh, the metals. And then, of course, these acquisitions have to stack up uh, according to fundamental investment criteria. So Neil, just listening to you on that, then surely somewhere like Canada must come up on your radar because it's got good tier one jurisdiction and virtually you know zero carbon energy. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Listen, um, we 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 have just been very. First of all, I want to say COVID was a big disruptor to our strategy in that uh, it was very hard to do due diligence under COVID um, restrictions. So um, it wasn't that we were slow, we were just prohibited um, because of the pandemic. But, uh, um, you know, we did, uh, we did five transactions last year of which four remain. Um, and we intend to do more this year, but it's difficult at current, um, current prices, but Canada certainly fits that criteria, absolutely. Uh, to be clear, lithium and nickel, you think, are the leading EV material? When we look at the, the, the battery metal trends in terms of uh, battery metal chemistries, um, you, you, can see, um, you can see a gradual squeeze on, on, the, um, on the manganese and, and the cobalt aspects. Um, so, so I wouldn't say that we would be anti-investing in that, but it's certainly not our our primary focus would you you know consider further you know downstream investments in the cathode side or you think the refining side is you know the more appealing end of it yeah no no we 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 have actually made investments uh, um in on the cathode side we recently um invested in in Verco, uh which is a partnership uh um, state-owned French partnership between Renault and a number of other French um, uh, industrial companies. Um, and, um, and, and certainly the aim is not to become a, a, a battery manufacturer per se, um, but, uh, but rather to be just fully in, integrated into those ecosystems. I one other aspect that's important in our approach is you, you would see, whereas in PGMs, we, are, we own 100% of what we buy, in, in entering new metals and new technologies, and, and especially some of the downstream side, it is, it is done more with um, partnerships and, um, and, and with a number of, let's say, more experienced stakeholders, because, you know, we're learning. We're learning very fast. 
the refinery in France um, was um, a good commercial opportunity. Um, and, um, and that was an opportunity to get into the, the, the nickel business. Um, again, I want to say we didn't buy the nickel refinery in France uh, for what it is today. It needs to, to be converted into uh, battery precursors such as uh, uh, nickel sulfate and so on. So, so but it is, it is more than just mining. And in fact, if you look at our, our refresh strategy, we talk about um, you know, participating in climate change reversal and becoming involved in energy solutions that do that. So, so it's, it's, uh, we're not confused. We still know our core competency is mining, but I would argue that um, um, the, the metals are keys to, to, to um, being very prosperous in some of the downstream activities as well. Okay, just one last one from me, Neil. In terms of um, lithium assets, are you sort of agnostic across Brian, Hard Rock, DLE, what have you, or you know, do you lean, given your your you know Savanya's background, towards more Hard Rock? Uh, look, that's that's much easier for us. Um, um, but I I would say that um, you know again, a bit like um, my my one of my earlier comments that the first filter we find ourselves going through with investors is is what is your your ESG credentials. When we look at uh, at projects, it's about the carbon footprint, and and some of those that you mention have um, uh, questionable um, uh, environmental credentials. You you have to be careful with water. Um, you know some of the um, geothermal stuff. The technology we've looked at um, has to be uh, proven. Some of it is far from the market. So I would say we, we, um, we, we would look at all of it uh, as long as those uh, attributes um, stack up for us. Eh? What about Africa? Uh, you're based in Africa um, and, uh, you know, Africa is a lot of countries. So, um, you know, but there are lithium assets in, in the DRC and Zimbabwe and Mali, and Ghana. Um, I'm sure there are some nickel assets. Uh, do you have any, and mo uh, they're mostly hard rock, um, like Caliber. What are your thoughts on pot potentially in investing in Africa for Europe and North American markets? Our particular problem is that, um, 80% of our current earnings come out of South Africa. So, um, you know, that has a certain risk profile. Um, we are trying to geographically diversify. So I, I would say that's a secondary, a, a secondary strategy to improve our, our valuations. And, um, and therefore, it would probably be difficult until we have a, a majority of, of, of um, uh, assets um, in the rest of the world, um, because certainly we, you know, going to the DRC where there's wonderful opportunity, is not going to really um, um, improve our our overall um, risk profile. It'll just uh, it'll either stay the same or get worse. The same with Zimbabwe. Um, so so we we are more focused uh, in um, in other jurisdictions that are going to actually improve. The perception of risk, uh, and once we've done that, we will look at Africa. Okay, um, those things also probably apply to you know some countries in South America. Um, Absolutely. Um, okay. As you view this battery material space, do you have in mind a certain percentage of revenue or EBITDA over, say, a five or ten year period? We would like to see about a third of our EBITDA coming out of, um, let's call it battery metals, a third out of PGMs and a third out of gold. At the moment, um, you know, our margins in the PGM space, both in the US and in South Africa, uh, are significant. So it's difficult to, to even see how you'd get to a third, um, a third PGMs and a third battery metals. But I, I am realistic and I think, um, the market will normalize, um, and we're talking over five years. So, um, you know, we've got another four years to go 
Well, I want to dig a little bit deeper into um, your investment in Ioneer because that's a very substantial um, uh, investment. We've been looking at lithium for a long time and, and wondering, you know, when is big mining, you know, going to come in or big oil or big chemical, um, your, your mid-tier mining, um, but it was a, a very substantial, um, you know, partnership. So you invested 70 million US dollars in Ioneer, you know, at parent level, you know, in October at 65 yeah. cents as part of a deal to invest a further $490 million for a 50% interest at, at, at project level. It, it's an earn in, I guess, into th that project level, it, but it implies approximately a billion dollar valuation for the project, you know, for 100%. Um, lithium prices and lithium equities have risen significantly since you signed that deal. Uh, but Ioneer on balance relative to its peers is, has been less well performing. It's trading a bit at 75 cents a bit up, but um, despite the fact that it's ostensibly, you know, fully funded. So could you just, like, like what attracted you to Ioneer? And I think the big, you know, outstanding question there is like, how did you get comfortable with the, the team's buckwheat, you know, rare plant consideration, you know, before making that $70 million investment? Um, obviously, we did extensive um, due diligence, and um, the one thing we are very proud of um, in the U.S. is what we call our Good Neighbors Agreement in Montana. Um, we have exceptionally um, good relationships, um, and it's based on a very formal agreement with the landowners, which um, um, effectively funds them. Uh, and provides them with capacity to bring in their own consultants and uh, and make sure that they are comfortable. We um, we are not doing anything that is um, negative to the environment, and we've had no no litigation in that region for for well over ten years. That that in our minds is is a, a very um, uh, credible uh, and important selling point for dealing with the buckwheat. Um, now, we, we believe that, um, um, that the work that Ioneer did on the buckwheat um, is, is credible. Um, but of course, it's always difficult to, to convince the environmentalists. And, um, and if you do it, let's call it in, in the way originally proposed, you gotta, you're going to first have to, to demonstrate that you can reproduce the buckwheat, that you can relocate um from your nurseries buckwheat into other areas and so on and that can take four or five you know many years um what we've arrived at as a group um is is rather to redesign the pit that we don't um interfere with the buckwheat uh, initially and um and and then in parallel you you do the studies that i've mentioned and um and we believe you can get a mine permitted and as you've quite rightly pointed out, um, our investment into, in, into the Rhyolite Ridge project only happens when those permits are granted. So, so we have not had to make that investment yet, um, although we're confident that we, we will get a permit and, and, um, and we will be able to demonstrate uh, you know, good environmental credentials. Um, and, um, and of course, that money is part of the capital to build um, the Rhyolite Ridge project. So it's a, to me, it was very smartly structured to minimize risk, but to also ensure that the, the money goes into, into the ground, so as to speak. So um, I'm, I'm confident with the, let's say, the working together with the Ionia team and Jim Calloway, um, that um, we will we will resolve this issue, and we've got a track record where we can demonstrate to Americans that you know we you can go and check our track record in Montana, right next to the Yellowstone Park, uh, on the Stillwater River where the the trout are still prospering, and so on and so on, and and I think working um, jointly with all stakeholders will get this done. That's very helpful. I had not realized uh, that whole Montana discussion. I knew you were in Stillwater, but I, I didn't realize, um, you know, clearly you bring mining skills and U.S. presence, but uh, from an environmental point of view. Uh, so are you, um, as, as part of your 
I mean, you, you put $70 million, you know, skin in the game, right? It's, it has, it's more than an option, but it, it, it option value, but, you know, and it's enabled Ioneer, which has done more detailed engineering, I think, than any other U.S. project to further advance that detail engineering. So upon getting permitted in the second half, it, it is, you know, definitively um, shovel ready. Uh, but are, are you, I know they've applied to the Department of Energy loan projects office, you know, to get funding for that. I mean, to what extent are you assisting Ioneer um, in helping get it permitted now that you're in the company? Yeah, so 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 Ioneer has not required any financial assistance and we would be more than happy um, to back them uh, as our partner should they uh, require financial assistance. We have provided um, more technical and, uh, and environmental assistance. And hence, uh, let's say uh, why we have uh, a slightly refined and reviewed plan that will be retabled uh, probably towards uh, September sometime. Um, so so the, the investment in Ioneer, just to be clear, was really a defense mechanism should uh, somebody else uh, try to upend us in, in terms of the JV. So um, it wasn't uh, anything else other than that. And of course it was done with their full knowledge and support. Eh? Okay, that's another interesting point I, I hadn't considered. Um, so we know James Calloway, Rodney and I actually visited Rylight Ridge uh, in 2018 or, or 19. We've done a little bit of business uh, with them. We're not currently retained by them at all. And. and uh, by the way, just um, we always like to say in these, uh, we we don't have an investment or, an, or advisor relationship with Savanya. Um, we're not investment advisors. This is just uh, you know information. But we do know James. You know he has a track record of, of building a successful lithium business. In addition to being a successful entrepreneur prior to that, you know, similar to you, I, I look at you and we're talking, and I I, I could see how you and uh, and James would would kind of get along. So I guess how important w w was the relationship with James, you know, in getting comfortable, you know, with with partnering with with Ioneer? Yeah, I, I think um, it was very important. Uh, um, my first meeting with James was was a long meeting. Uh, it was over a very, um, uh, a very comfortable lunch, but we very quickly found that we, we had a lot of um, uh, similar values. Experienced operators know that you're not going to end up with cultural boxing matches. Um, the one aspect that both James and I have an affinity for is trees, funny enough, and uh, the importance of trees. You know, so, so um, you know, we... We, we really, um, let's say, take the buckwheat uh, uh, issue seriously, but uh, we, 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 we got along well, we have um, similar values, and it was easy to get a deal done. Um, and, and in fact, uh, you know, my team worked very closely with, with James in getting it done with very little, uh, let me say, um, interference from my side. Um, and uh, I think we ended up with a really nice arrangement and the working arrangement since concluding the deal has also been good. I'm going to switch to the, your nickel deal in Brazil, uh, which you alluded to, um, but that, 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 that was a billion dollar deal. Um, I was at the BMO conference in February and, and I ran into some of the Appian people who were clearly not happy. <laughs> so I understand you, you the, the material adverse uh, event kind of clause, I guess it, it would happen there because uh, I think Appian is suing. Yeah, they say they're going to sue us. I think they they need to consider their position very carefully before they actually do that. There were two assets involved. There was the Santa Rita um, uh, nickel mine uh, and there was the uh, Cer uh copper asset. The, the acquisition was for both of those assets. The transaction could only close if both those assets, you know, were completed in terms of what we had agreed. Before closing, but after signing the deal, there was a geotechnical event where a large part of the sidewall of the pit failed and ran into the pit. In our view, we took from November to late January to assess the impact and, um, and certainly with our experts and with our assessment, it, uh, it was material.
the agreement allowed that if there was a material adverse uh, change or effect on one of the assets, um, the transaction on both the assets wouldn't uh, close. And that's simply what happened. I personally wish the geotechnical event had not happened. We want more nickel assets. We want more um, uh, lithium assets. Copper, I haven't spoken about, but is a common denominator between all these. But essentially, as I explained, we are very disciplined on value. And there was a material uh, adverse effect on our valuation assumptions. And, uh, and we walked away. We invoked uh, the contract. How much capital you know, do you think you'll deploy in the EV battery, battery metal space over the next you know, kind of five years? And, and how many projects do you think you could take on? Hard to give you a, a capital number, but uh, it's a bit like a, a Rolls Royce. Uh, the horsepower is sufficient for whatever we want to do. Um, we, we have sufficient access to, to capital. I think um, the challenge, especially with uh, the markets as frothy as this, is to, to, to find value. Um, we would love to, as you've heard, grow our, our battery metals business to you know, a third of our earnings. Um, so that's the target. If we could do, we have the capacity uh, to do another four or five transactions this year, if if we could find them, and as long as they were value accretive, uh, we would do it. We have very significant experience to integrate operating assets into our business, as we have uh, shown in 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 platinum, as we have shown with caliber, as we are, are showing with uh, um, uh, Sandoval in France. So um, we would love to grow our battery metals business, but it's got to be value accretive it's not just strategic and um and academic it's got to be value accretive what's your sense with biden and the defense you know production act you know the, the movement politically as an observer but also an investor in the united states there ha seems to be a marked shift here covid plus russia what's your read on the momentum of you know, making permitting easier and, and getting Americans to fundamentally appreciate that we need to mine in our backyard. We have had very good interactions with some of the agencies that you've referred to. We've always had good relations with the American um, representatives in South Africa as being part of the uh, solution. I'm happy with what I see happening behind the scenes. There is real attempts to improve self-sufficiency um, and i think it's absolutely the right thing and we are very committed as i've said many times to to these agencies of producing north american palladium for north america or you know uh, u.s palladium for um, u.s cars we we're committed for that we're not contract miners we we have as i've explained all the way through um, this uh, interview we've positioned ourselves in these ecosystems we have a track record of having helped um, both fiat chrysler and ford um, with substitution of palladium with platinum to to reduce costs in exhaust systems and so on so it, it's absolutely the 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 right things that are happening and i'm encouraged with what i'm seeing and therefore i'm confident as i said of getting iron the um royal outreach uh, project permitted that sounds great you're reminding me of one last thing is that you're you're there are very few miners who understand auto oem procurement but you with pgms do because you have been selling and adding value and partnerships are increasingly key um because they're not understanding as in our observation you know the lithium market very well right they're treating it like steel or uh, aluminum and you as an explainer to the auto oems i think are extremely well placed okay let's leave it at that um neil thank you very much for joining us for an hour or so um and um you know we look forward to continuing the dialogue and and maybe um you know we could do this again uh at a, at a ribbon cutting uh once you get the permitting <laughs> perfect uh, i would love to do that uh and and really an excellent uh, um set of questions well done to to yourself and 
and Rod, Rodney.